Just about every person I know that's gotten into 3D printing over the past few years has started out with PLA, which makes a ton of sense. PLA is a great material, it's awesome for experimenting with and learning the basics of 3D printing. And to this day, if my project doesn't need things like more heat resistance or more uh, impact resistance, then PLA is the material that I usually default to. For anyone that does go into other materials, I would argue the second most common material that's 3D printed today is PETG and seems to sort of be the next step in the natural progression for most people in their 3D printing journey. PETG is a great material with a lot of unique properties that make it perfect for functional applications in circumstances where PLA just won't suffice. There's a reason that all of the Prusa MK3 machines as well as their Prusa Mini is made out of PETG and not PLA. Although PETG is definitely a less demanding material to print with than something like nylon or polycarbonate, there are some additional things to consider when going from that if you're used to printing with PLA. And I'm currently working on a project that requires me to print out roughly three kilograms of PETG parts, so I figured what better time than now to cover this material. So today's video will be all about PETG. We'll talk about the material and how it's actually used in the real world. We'll talk about why you may want to 3D print with it, what the requirements are both on the hardware as well as the slicer side of things. And of course, we'll do some 3D printing. So with all that being said and without further ado, let's get right into today's video. Starting off, let's talk a bit about the material and its properties. Polyethylene terephthalate glycol, or PETG, as it's more commonly called, is often used in manufacturing. It's commonly found in both the medical industry and it's often used for food packaging. Although PETG is typically considered food safe in traditional manufacturing, that is not the case with 3D printing. The primary reason for that is just the way that 3D prints are formed, which is a layer on top of a layer. Even if those layers are really fine, they are a perfect avenue for bacteria to become trapped. And the only way you'd really be able to have a 3D printed part be considered food safe would be to make sure that your hardware is food safe and you would need to coat that printed part with something like a food safe epoxy. If you're interested in food safe 3D printing, I highly recommend that you do some additional research because there is quite a bit involved with that. PETG has great impact resistance, chemical resistance, and is fully recyclable. Most common water bottles are made out of PET, which is a PETG without a glycol modifier. Hackaday has a really awesome article on PET and PETG if you really want to get down to the chemical science that I can link you to in the description of this video. Although there are both PET and PETG filaments that are available to print with, PETG is going to be much more common and much more popular. PET is typically a bit stiffer, meaning it's not going to have the same level of impact resistance that PETG has. Some reasons to print with PETG over PLA is for its added impact resistance, thanks to its little bit of flex, its added heat resistance, its UV resistance that it has built into it, its chemical resistance, and the fact that PETG, generally speaking, is going to be a more translucent material. If you look at raw PLA pellets and you look at raw PETG pellets, the raw PETG or natural pellets are a much more translucent tone than that of PLA. With me living in Southern California on a hot summer day, if I have a PLA part that has been printed and it is sitting in my car, it is very possible that that part will warp, which is not the case with PETG. Also, if I was going to be printing something that was going to be more outside than inside, ideally I would go with ASA, which we've covered on this channel, but between PLA and PETG, PETG is also going to be a better option. I'll have a TDS for both PLA and PETG in the description of this video if you want to compare and contrast the results of the different tests. Now that we've talked a bit about PETG as a material and some of the reasons why you might want to 3D print with it, let's go over the hardware requirements to print with this material. I recently built the Prusa MK3S Plus over on the ModBot Army channel during a live stream, and as part of my testing, I'm going to be printing the three kilograms of PETG through this machine, so that's what we're gonna use in today's video. With that being said, don't worry because most of the 3D printing I've done with PETG over the years has been on machines like the Ender 3, and you definitely do not need something like the Prusa printer to be able to print with this material. Starting off with the hot end, the MK3S Plus comes with an all-metal E3D V6, which is a fairly common hot end that's capable of hitting roughly 300 Celsius. Now, most filament manufacturers that I've seen will provide a pretty broad range of temperatures that their filament can be printed with. And for PETG, the most common range I've seen is on the low end, roughly 230 Celsius, to on the high end, 250 to 255 Celsius. 
The sweet spot I've found for printing with PETG filament over the years has been between 240 to 245 Celsius. Now, the good news is, is that it technically means you don't need an all metal hot end to print with this material. However, I highly recommend you getting one if you plan on doing a lot of printing with PETG. Non all metal hot ends like what comes stock on the Ender 3 has a Teflon or PTFE lining that goes all the way through the hot end down to the nozzle. And that will start to degrade very heavily at around 250 Celsius and can even start to degrade below that. And all it takes is that you have a slight bit of deviation between what the hot end is outputting and what your thermistor is reading to have that happen. And the Teflon, when it does melt, it is quite toxic. So my recommendation is this, if you're planning on doing an occasional PETG print, then you're probably okay as long as you stick to the lower end of the scale to run it on a non all metal hot end. However, if you know that you're going to be printing a lot of PETG and that's something you're interested in, I highly recommend doing the upgrade, not only for not damaging your hot end, but also for your safety. And on something like the Ender 3, we've covered the Micro Swiss hot end, which is a drop-in replacement. So it doesn't take very long and then you don't have to worry about the PTFE line in your hot end. PETG is sort of known to be one of the materials that likes to goop up around your hot end. That's kind of the only way I can describe it is like a goop or a blob. And I am a firm believer that just about every hot end should have a silicone sock on there. The silicone sock will do a couple of things. One, it will help to insulate your hot end. Two, it'll keep any of the strings that are caused by the PETG being extruded to keep off of your hot end. And in the worst case scenario that you have a really bad failure, the silicone sock sort of acts as a shield between your printed part that's failed and your thermistor and your heater cartridge because if you get a lot of PETG up around the hot end, it is going to be very difficult to save the hot end or at least that thermistor and heater cartridge. So silicone socks are super cheap. Most common hot ends will have them already, but if you do not, I highly recommend getting one. For the nozzle, you don't need anything special and a standard brass nozzle will work fine, unless of course you are using something that's like a carbon-based PETG or a glass uh, PETG or something like a glow-in-the-dark. Then you will of course want a wear-resistant nozzle. With that being said, the PETG, again, back to the gloopiness, does seem to really like to stick to brass nozzles. So if you are running into issues and you seem to have a problem with the PETG building up around your nozzle, I would definitely look into something like a coated nozzle. Um, there are nickel plated or nickel coated nozzles that are much less likely to have the PETG stick to them. They're quite inexpensive and they can really, really help out. The MK3S Plus has a dual gear direct drive extruder and that is not a requirement to print with PTG. I've used the stock single geared plastic Creality extruder that comes on a lot of their machines like the Ender 3 and printed this material fine. However, the better extruder you have, whether it's a direct drive or a Bowden, is going to give you much more consistency in your extrusions. And because PTG typically is, is a bit stringier of a material than PLA, it's going to be much easier to dial in your settings using a direct drive setup versus a Bowden. But if you are using a Bowden setup, that's absolutely fine. I would just recommend printing some sort of retraction test beforehand so that way you can figure out the sweet spot before doing a big print and running into all sorts of stringing issues. For the bed, you will need a heated bed, which luckily has become a standard. That wasn't always the case. My temperature or sweet spot for printing with PETG is 70 Celsius. And my favorite bed surface for printing with PETG is powder coated uh, PEI. Now the Prusa that I have here came with a uh, smooth PEI sheet, which both Smooth PEI and BuildTac will stick very well to PETG, but they will stick too well to PETG. I've seen on multiple occasions where someone's printed on direct BuildTac with PETG or on a Smooth PEI, and then when they go to remove their print, part of the sheet is stuck in the bottom of their PETG print. So what I recommend doing is taking a bit of glue stick and the glue stick is actually not to help the PETG stick. It's a barrier between your build surface and the PETG. So on glass, I typically use a bit of glue stick. I have powder coated PEI sheets on most of my printers that I'm doing a lot of printing with because it's just my go-to. But again, if you've got a standard build tack or kind of what the Creality machines come with, a lot of them is a knockoff build tack or smooth PEI, be sure to put something down like glue stick. Otherwise you will run the risk of damaging your bed surface. Good news is unlike ABS, you do not need to have an enclosure to print with PTG. And I would say that 90% or more of my PTG printing over the years has been done on open format machines. 
One big difference between PLA and PETG is the hygroscopic nature of PETG. I don't think I've ever had real issues with PLA that I've left open for long periods of time other than that maybe it becomes a bit more brittle, which baking that out will usually resolve that. While PETG, I've had a lot of issues with moisture and it seems to have just gotten worse over the years. So I would say if you're serious about printing with PETG or really just if you're serious about 3D printing other than PLA, you should have some sort of a drying solution. I know some people use their ovens, some people use dehydrators that they sort of makeshift. I covered a couple options a few months ago at this point. I think one was around $50 and one was around $120-ish, give or take. And I can link you in the description down to those. But I recommend regardless whether it's a new PTG, whether it's an open PTG, that you at least dry it to make sure you're starting from a dry state because wet PTG is not going to look good. It's going to be much more stringier and it doesn't matter how good your hardware is or how dialed in it is. If you have wet filament, it's just not going to turn out good. And for anyone that's wondering, my recommendation is I dry out PTG at around 65 Celsius for at least two hours before printing with a spool that I haven't used in a long time. Now that we've covered the hardware side of things, let's hop over to the slicer. There's actually not a whole lot to cover on the slicer side that we didn't already go over, but I always recommend starting off with the built-in default profile for whatever material you're using, regardless of the slicer. So in Pusha Slicer, I'm starting off with the generic PTG profile, which will get us pretty close to where we want to be. I am going to change the nozzle temperatures from the 230 and 240 to just the solid 245. I said that I print between 240 and 245, but typically I like to opt on the hotter side so that way I can push a bit more material as long as there's no issues with stringing. And then as far as the bed temp goes, they've got it set to the first layer of 85 and the other layers at 90, which is a bit odd to me. So I'm going to have the first layer be a bit warmer to just help with some of that initial adhesion. And then after that, I will switch to the 70 Celsius, which is what I typically run. I do typically run a layer cooling fan with PTG. My normal percent is 50% for the fan speed. Precisor had it built in at a range from minimum of 30% fan speed with a maximum of 50%. And that seems to be working out pretty well for me. But back when I was using Cura, I would just set the fan speed off for the first three layers layers and then 50% fan speed for the rest of the print. For all this settings, like the layer height and the perimeters, it's going to be completely up to what you're printing and the strength that you want. For this, the part calls for a 0.25 layer height with three perimeters and three top and solid bottom layers. So I'm going to enter those in. But again, this is just specific to whatever it is that you're printing. If you're printing something that's more, um, you know, for display than function, then you can go with maybe you want finer layer lines or maybe you want less or more shells and then for infill the default that it had on here was 20 percent the and stars for some reason i'm changing that to grid i don't print with stars <laughs> i think it's a pretty infill but uh grid's kind of my go-to that or typically gyroid and then for the infill 20 percent is also uh, what mine called for. It's completely up to you depending on how solid you want your part to be. I did cover this in a previous video, but I always run skirts on every single print. I don't care the material. This just allows me to verify that the uh, bed is still even or, or leveled as it needs to be. So three loops is typically what I recommend. And then as far as a brim goes, I've never used a brim with PTG because I don't usually have warping problems, which is a bit ironic because as you'll see here in a moment, I did end up having a warping problem with this particular print because I picked a very odd print for this video, but normally you don't need a brim for printing with PETG. Speed-wise, the defaults in Prusa Slicer should be fine. I think that 80% or 80 millimeters per second for the infill is a little bit aggressive if you don't have your material dialed in. Because I've been printing with these settings on the Prusa, I know that it's completely capable of running at that, but I always recommend starting off with slower speeds. If you're running into problems, you can always ramp that up later as you gain some success and familiarity. But again, if you want to start with the default speeds, that's fine, but going slower is never going to hurt you. So as I mentioned a moment ago, I did end up having to use a brim with this print. I started the print off and maybe an hour into it, I saw that the corners were lifting and 
Taking the advice of my recent video where I was having an issue with the printer that ended up being the G-code, I did take this file and look at the G-code after seeing some kind of interesting things on the bottom layer. And the thing I did not realize initially was just how uh, little surface area there was on the bottom layer. And there was a few areas, as you can see here, where it was sliced and there just wasn't really any extrusion. So I did go ahead and add a brim for this particular print, which just allowed me to get proper adhesion and have the print uh, print successfully and then after this print I turned the brim back off and I've since printed probably another four or five different very large PETG parts that just didn't need it. Every print there's a little bit of uh, analyzing it and seeing, hey, is there anything unique that's needed? Does it need supports? Does it need this brim? So the settings, although they will get you 95% of the way there, there's always the 5% that you'll have to just consider and analyze depending on the parts geometries. I hope that you guys enjoyed this video and if you've been considering printing with PETG and you follow the steps outlined in this video, I can guarantee you you'll be much better off than just going in blind to a new material. I would love to know in the comments down below anybody that has been printing with PTG, if there's anything new that you learned in this video, or if there's something that I just didn't touch on that you've seen or that you've learned from printing with PTG that you think might be useful to someone that is looking to print with this material or somebody that's maybe been trying to print with this material but has been unsuccessful so far or just having really mixed results. On that note, don't forget to like and subscribe for more great videos. We make a video every single week, so there's always fresh content coming your way. And if you do want to support the channel furthermore, I'll place links down below in the description over to our Patreon, where there are some really awesome rewards. Huge thank you to all of our existing Patreon supporters. I appreciate each and every one of you allowing me to come back every single week and spend more time doing what I love, which is making content for you all to enjoy. On that note, this has been Daniel from ModBot, and I look forward to seeing you guys in my next video. Peace, guys.